when we were planning this event, we really wanted to make it compelling. We wanted to hear from powerful and innovative voices. And I think our first panel reflects just what we were aiming for. And thank you for that, guys. Now, among the voices we sought were those with a special and unique place in philanthropy. And this next guest certainly occupies such a place. We're thrilled he's taking time from his many, many commitments to join us. In fact, he flew back uh, from Haiti late last night to be with us. This is someone who has made an enormous contribution to this country and to, his wor and to this world and who in his current life is extending and deepening those contributions in extraordinary ways and inspiration to all of us. Someone who believes as strongly as we do in the power of technology to advance social change. And who appreciates that internet freedom, access, openness are essential to helping all people achieve their potential. It is my profound honor to welcome to the Ford Foundation on this occasion of the Wired for Change conference, a man who not only was here when it was morning in America, but when it's actually a bright, sunny day, the 42nd President of the United States, William Jefferson Clinton. Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elise. I was reading the program for the conference and listening to the people who were speaking before briefly and thinking that uh, I was the token dinosaur at this meeting. <laughs> I, uh, I sent a grand total of two emails when I was president. One to uh, some of our troops in the Adriatic when we were conducting our operations in Kosovo. And one to John Glenn when he was 77 years old in outer space. I figured it was okay if Congress subpoenaed those. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think it's really important what you're doing here and what I would like to do is to basically both join the chorus and uh, issue a couple of cautionary notes. Uh, when I was president, it, it was the time of greatest expansion, arguably, of the whole information technology era because when I took office in January of 93, there were only 50 sites on the internet. More than that had been added since I was introduced. <laughs> and the average cell phone weighed five pounds. <laughs> so our ability to use it in the way it's used now as an instrument of social justice was somewhat restricted. It was better for bicep building, but otherwise not very good. Today, in the work that I do, I see it all the time. In Haiti now, for example, uh, the cell phone companies are trying to promote banking in a country where, like so many co poor countries, it's kept poor by the rich people in the country, not by the poor people by a very rigid banking system that is content to hold on to money, only make big loans, and uh, essentially charge substantial fees for the remittances that make up about 19% of Haiti's GDP as people who work in the United States and elsewhere send money home. So now they're promoting banking through cell phones. It's really, really important. After the earthquake, uh, thanks to Google, a lot of people were found alive before they died. And Americans made an enormous uh, contribution privately to Haiti earthquake relief, and half of it they made 
through internet and now cell phone contributions by dialing a number which automatically transferred ten dollars to the Red Cross or to the Clinton Bush Haiti Fund or whatever, anybody that had a number. Uh, today in the work I'm doing in the reconstruction of Haiti, we recreated what was done in South Asia after the, uh, I worked for two years for the United Nations on rebuilding the, after the Indian Ocean tsunami. And uh, we put everything up on the internet. And people told me, we, oh God, you're n never gonna be able to spend this money right in Indonesia. There's this whole heritage of corruption. It's just horrible. And we actually went to the NGOs who had their own money and we said, would you actually submit your contributions along with, and your activities along with everything the national donors and the multinational donors are doing and we'll put all the information on the internet if you cooperate, including uh, who your local partners are, how much money they got, what they're supposed to do, when the projects are finished, and what the results are. So, and it is generally thought to have been a completely corruption-free enterprise. So in Haiti, they told me the same thing. Oh my God, it's gonna be a sinkhole. So we went to the NGOs, most of them had agreed to post their contributions and the donors are and everybody that gets uh, it post their contributions gets a free performance audit all of which will be on the internet and it's uh, amazing they've never had anything like this there but we tend to sometimes patronize poor people and assume that the local activists won't activate the internet and as we see now in Egypt and Tunisia and all these other places where there are demonstrations in the streets, it's always a great mistake to underestimate the intelligence of average people who have been disempowered for too long. So all the things that have been said today and all the things that will be said when I leave are true and good. But I think it's important that we kind of disaggregate this and look at the role of technology in uh, political and personal empowerment and uh, economic advancement and also frankly acknowledge that the context in which it operates is important. Uh, the speech that uh, Hillary gave yesterday on internet freedom just reminds us that there's still a lot of people from China to Iran and other countries that spend a lot of time and effort trying to restrict access to information technology because they know what it can do. Uh, we also are, I heard that, that someone mentioned the ability in America of people who disagree with most of us in this room to mobilize uh, technology, but at least it's a fair fight here. If you don't rely on information technology to advance progressive views, it ain't a fair fight because the a political right who believes in a restoration of trickle-down economics uh, and basically destroying the federal government's role in building the future of America while leaving alone 85% of the drivers of the deficit, Medicare, Medicaid, and defense. I respect them. They have an agenda and they promote it. The rest of the media is so worried about being called liberal, they cover a conflict process. I mean, I'm convinced now if you look at the way they talk about climate change, that if tomorrow Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh decided that after all, the sun revolved around the earth, the next report on the network news would be, of course, some people believe <laughs> that the sun revolves around the earth. And the great thing about the internet is, you know, a lot of those kids in Tunisia didn't have any money but they had equally loud voices. So I think on balance, this is a plus, but we need to evaluate it. When, when I was president, things were a, a lot more benign, but what it seemed to me, even then, that if we were going to go into a global economy where in effect, our open markets were America's foreign aid budget, I mean, we, we didn't have much foreign assistance. Almost all other countries gave more than we did. 
but we were better than most other countries in letting people bring their products into our country, and we got better with the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act and several other things. That if we were going to have markets this open, then A, we had to be able to enforce the trade laws, and B, we had to have a source of new employment every five to eight years. And it was clear to me that the obvious candidate in the 1990s as information technology moved out of Silicon Valley and Route 128 in Massachusetts and out of the interchange center in the D.C. area and the video game companies in Texas it's into every aspect of American life was that if we speeded that up and democratized it, it would dramatically change the shape of the American economy and give us at least a chance to mitigate this headlong rush toward greater inequality that you see uh, has been in place in the United States and many other countries at least since 1980 and the triumph of financial economics over production economics. And it worked. We had 8% of our employment was in information technology, but 30% of our new jobs were. And because they paid more, 35% of our intro growth was. And by the second four years I served, it had generated so many jobs that unemployment got low, the labor market was tight, and that plus the extra supports we were trying to give to middle and lower income people gave us the only four year period since 1980 when the bottom 20% income in percentage terms rose just ever so slightly more than the top 10%, 20%. Now, we didn't do anything to change the mix within the top 20% toward pushing the 1% up. But it's very important to see this whole technology thing, in the United States at least, against that context. Before this financial meltdown on September the 15th, 2008, before that happened, the, in seven years and eight months, the United States had only produced 2.5 million new jobs. And we were basically in net negative territory almost in the private sector because a lot of those jobs were government and defense related in the aftermath of 9-11. Median family income was down $2,000 after inflation while health care costs had doubled. So there's a lesson here for the wealthy countries and the question of political and personal empowerment. You have to have a source of new employment every five to eight years if you want to keep your borders open, which keeps inflation down and allows us to offer trade opportunities instead of cut them off, as we did for many years, to poorer countries. And we have to keep asking ourselves, as Americans and uh, as Europeans particularly, so what's the next opportunity in technology? It may not be in information technology, by the way. I think that uh, if you look at the climate change challenge, the reason there was no agreement in Copenhagen is that there's still too many people who are either vested in the old energy economy or don't trust the new one to produce enough jobs and economic growth to take a flying leap into commitment. And technology can solve a lot of that too. And if you have any questions, just walk down to the Empire State Building and look what they're doing. Johnson Controls has guaranteed them a 38% reduction in their electric bills by a 38% reduction in their greenhouse gas emissions, and they are generating so many jobs with new technology that they cleared off a whole floor of the Empire State Building and created an in-house factory to cut the transportation energy cost as they replace the windows, the heating and air conditioning, the lighting, the insulation, the whole nine yards. They will actually realize about 42% uh, saving, I predict and it's gonna be the oldest big building in the world with the Leeds rating. And it's very important, and they created hundreds of jobs, and because they're self-financing, the payout will be about four and a half years, which is stunning for that level of investment. If they had to borrow the money, it'd be about a seven-year payout, which presents you with America's <coughs> biggest current economic problem. Nobody likes to loan money on energy efficiency projects that take more than two years. And if you save 20% or less, you can almost always pay that off in 18 months. But if you do, the more you go up beyond that, if you add bank financing to it, the more you're getting into four, five, six, seven-year loans. I've been trying for a year and a half 
to convince the government to set aside a loan guarantee program like the SBA loan guarantee to guarantee these bank loans because it really just, it won't cost you a penny as a taxpayer because all these big projects already have a guarantee of savings from the energy service companies. But they prove up the guarantee in two years after which they're off the hook. So if the government guarantee is important in case the building goes down before the loan's paid off. But that's just something for you to think about. The, the whole question of technology is intimately caught up in the question of whether we should or should not become more protectionist and whether we can or cannot repeat those four years, the last four years of the last decade of the 20th century when we actually had the bottom 20% growing as much as the top 20% beginning to reverse this horrible global trend toward inequality. So I say that to, to make the first point. We can't get so carried away with all this that we forget that there is still a context in which all efforts unfold. So it matters what the traditional institutions are in poor countries, in rich countries, in democracies, and autocracies. And it matters whether individual empowerment is tied to a vision of common advancement or not. It matters whether, not whether we're right or left, but whether we are communitarian or not, whether we believe that fundamentally societies and eventually global movements must rise or fall together, and whether there is a vested public interest everywhere in trying to do that. When, when I was president, one of the things we tried to do was to make sure that the digital divide was as small as possible, that we empowered as many people as possible. We gave $2 billion worth of subsidies for schools and libraries and hospitals through the E-rate and a number of other things to try to deal with that. It matters what your vision is. The current dominant vision in Congress, which the American people ratified by voting or not voting, as the case may be in the midterm election, is that this is a socialist nightmare and that God gives us all the money we're entitled to and that any government who takes a penny of it is a thief unless it's for defense <laughs> or for apparently for Medicare or Medicaid. But anything you do to build a common future is a fool's errand. And so this budget debate is operating, uh, and I think I established my credentials as a fiscal conservative, but we've had exactly four surpluses since we began the trickle-down economics experiment in 1981 and they all occurred in my second term. But I have a very different theory of it. I'm a Keynesian. I, John Maynard Keynes said that the government should run deficits and recessions and depressions to minimize them and to overcome the effect of the absence of private investment and spending and should run balanced budgets or surpluses in good times. We have ne we never, we never, and neither did any other country, really, with any kind of economy, believed that permanent deficits were a good thing because taxes were always bad, and no matter how low you cut them, they'd always produce more revenues than they cost, until 1981. And we reversed that for eight years, and our economy performed better, and unbelievably, the American people in the last election said, let's try that one more time because the Democrats are the big spenders because of the stimulus program, which everybody knows failed. False, parenthetically. But that means that our side did a lousy job in the current environment, which is another reason the internet's important, in explaining that the stimulus was a one-off to overcome the effect of a contracting economy. 36% of it went to a tax cut. And the other party didn't credit that tax cut because I didn't get it. Only the bottom 95% got it, so it didn't count. It's true. Nobody knew it. But that's our fault. That's the progressives' fault. We kept it a secret. And a uh, third of the money went to save jobs, teachers and healthcare workers mostly, so local governments wouldn't have to raise money. A third of the money went 
to create jobs, and every single survey shows it created more jobs than it was estimated, not fewer, but you can't fill a $3 trillion hole with $800 billion. And the fact that the American people who always make good decisions based on what they know felt that proved that, after all, the Democrats were the big spenders, not the Republicans, in spite of the fact that the debt had been doubled again after I left office before the financial meltdown, shows, number one, that we're lousy at communicating, and number two, that the internet may be the salvation of a static condition in the established media where the conservative media have an agenda and they pursue it, and a message and they advance it, and I respect that. And the so-called mainstream media is so paranoid about being called liberal, there's no such thing as a fact. And so the thing which gets covered is conflict and politics and process. Uh, exhibit A, I'll just give you one more on this because this is really important because how America unfolds and with the scope of this debate and how people get information and whether they believe there's any such thing as facts depends on what people get and how they get it in a very busy life where they got to worry about raising their kids, paying their bills, holding on to their job, making the mortgage payment. So it may be that in the United States, the power of the internet to communicate information may be more important here than any place else because as we learned in Egypt and Tunisia, it equalizes the poor and the rich in a way that nothing else has ever done in the dissemination of information. And yes, you can get a lot of wacko ideas. I dealt in my AIDS work with the problem we had in South Africa, which was for years, which was aggravated by the fact that the president found two articles on the internet where people said that AIDS was not caused by HIV and it was a big conspiracy by Western drug companies. So I'm not overdoing the romance here, but we've got to do something to equalize the, the forces. I remember four days after this election, a reporter, a journalist I admire very much, John King at CNN, put a microphone in Senator McConnell's face and said, now, Senator, you still want to repeal health care? He said, absolutely, it's a disaster and the people voted for it. He said, well, then are you prepared to cancel all those millions of contracts where American families are now insuring their children up to age 26 when their unemployment rate is twice that of young people, uh, twice that of older people, young people? And he didn't know what to say. Do you know why? because all through the election he was never asked the question. Because all that mattered before the election was process, tactics, deals. So I wanted to put my fist through the television, <laughs> not cheer. <laughs> but you gotta understand, this is what you can do. And that's basically what those kids did in Egypt, in Tunisia. They broadened the spectrum of political debate, they got out issues, and they also, we now know, made alliances with the group that opposed Mr. Milosevic in Serbia. They went to a training institute in Qatar. They, they worked together, so they were both individually empowered and community oriented, and they defined community as freedom-loving people within and beyond their borders. So the first thing I wanna say about this is as we get carried away with the romantic possibilities of this in the aftermath of Egypt and Tunisia, it is important to recognize that it was a bunch of individuals who were empowered to work in common toward a common goal, defining the public interest. And they will now descend into the messy world of politics and we will have to watch and support this reform movement not being hijacked either by radical authoritarianism in the guise of religion or by the forces of the status quo, who, as you see, have not really given up. And that is what the Secretary of State was worried about when she kept talking about an orderly transition. It wasn't how to reinforce things that we don't agree with. It is it's a great deal of difference between a moment which topples a structure and the effort designed to rebuild one. So that's the second point I wanna make. I spend most of my time now working in poor countries in ways that have nothing to do with the typical politics of America or what you read in the daily press. Yesterday I was in 
Haiti where we had an unusual meeting of our Reconstruction Commission with the two candidates in the runoff for president. And we explained what we were doing and what we wanted to do and basically asked for their blessing to continue to work for the next four or five months until one of them is inaugurated and not to slow down and then offered them a chance to be involved and to state their opposition if they were opposed to anything we were about to do, but we didn't want to shut the thing down. It was very interesting. But it, before the earthquake, 75% of the people of Haiti were living on less than $2 a day. Before the earthquake, 85% of the people had no electricity in their homes. Before the earthquake, no more than half the kids went to school every year, and more than half of them went to private schools where they had to pay tuition which explains why, before the earthquake, 200,000 children were in a system of child servitude known as the Restavec system, not because their parents are craven, but because they couldn't feed and school all their kids, and so normally they would sell one of them into indefinite labor to someone else, sometimes for as little as $40, not for the 40 bucks, but to get one of them off the payroll so they could educate and feed the others. If we can build for Haiti an educational system which provides free public education to all the kids and gives them a meal a day, 90% of the indentured child uh, labor in Haiti will vanish. And the point of that is this. Do they need more access to the internet? Absolutely. Internet banking has a chance in Haiti to shake the foundations of the stodgy old banking system and help us build a more modern system. I'm trying to do some other things to do it too. But it's also important to know that, that in a lot of these countries, the real problem is they don't have functioning systems. What would you do if you were me and we're about to let all these, we're about to approve all these contracts, not contracts, we're about to approve all these builders we have had one, we're about to have a second housing expo where everybody who wants to build houses in Haiti and get donor money for doing it has to put up a model home and they get extra points for energy efficiency, for using solar technology, for figuring out how to dispose of the waste in a way that will pre uh, prevent a future cholera outbreak without a centralized sewer system. They get extra points if for how few houses they have to have contracts to build before they'll put a plant up in Haiti to manufacture products in Haiti as opposed to bringing them in from out of the country. They get extra points from having a Haitian partner. What would you do if you were our commission on the sewer issue? There's no sewer network. What would you do on the electric issue? Would you put solar panels on all the homes or would you increase the base load capacity? And if so, would you do it with wind or solar? Or would you be so desperate uh, that you play with the local powers that be and let them generate more electricity from diesel when the Caribbean already has the highest electric rates in the world and Haiti, the poorest country, the rates are higher than everybody else's. And everybody's griping at you but get me out of these tents. The most miserable conceivable thing. What's the point of all that? The point I'm trying to make is, do we need technology? Yes, but technology needs to also be in the service of helping to build functioning institutions. Big problem in all poor countries is they don't have the kind of institutions that we take for granted that got us all into these chairs today. Now, in wealthy countries, the problem is just the opposite. What caused this financial meltdown? Well, the financial institutions arguably work too well at warp speed. And you had an American economy that before the meltdown had all of its growth from housing, consumer spending, and finance, all of which are self-limiting or inherently limiting, right, because they're not new things that create new jobs, new opportunities, and which tend to push money up and aggregate it, and then all this money's dressed up and no place to go. So through the use of, among other things, information technology, people found more and more things to do with money that, was, that were removed further and further 
from the real economy that creates jobs and new businesses and empowers people to change their own lives. And it worked so well and so fast that when it crashed, it just blew right up. And then, God forbid, the government had to step in. And thank goodness they did. First under President Bush, then under President Obama to keep a total meltdown from occurring. We learned the lessons of 1929 and did not permit it to happen again, which was the cruel irony of this election being a referendum that said everything the government does is bad. But I say that because in wealthy countries, we have good systems. That's how I got here. And I, I, never, I was always amazed when I was in politics with people, you know, the people that were my base, my working class friends that say, you know, you overcame great adversity to be president. I said, what are you talking about? I was, I always had a roof over my head. I got to drink clean water. I had clothes on my back. I went to good schools. Uh, when I couldn't afford an education, I had access to a scholarship. Well, I, mean, I didn't have any adversity. I just, you know, wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. We take for granted things that I never see in other places. I mean, and it's important when you ask yourself, what can technology do, to ask yourself that. I mean, just look at all the stuff that's going on here. You'd be amazed if the screen went dark, the lights went out, the microphone failed, the air controls went bust, and we all got stiflingly hot. You might like it if the microphone failed, but otherwise <laughs> it would be a source of severe surprise. And I spent a lot of my life in places where people can take any of that for granted. That's why UNICEF goes out and helps kids go to school and all the other things that happen in the world. So the challenge in the poor countries is institution building. And the challenge in the rich countries is institutional reform. And the challenge in the autocratic, somewhere between rich and poor countries, may be both. Which is why it's hard to be head of China now. And why if you were president of China, you might try to rig the currency too, because you got $2.8 trillion in the bank and you're richer and all get out, but you got a lot of poor people still living in the country you don't know what to do with. What would you do if you were running the government of India, you're, you've had the most entrepreneurial economy in the world, you're growing like crazy, you have the world's biggest middle class, but the median income is still uh, the, under $1,000 a year. And you don't really have, because you've been more flexible, more entrepreneurial, more democratic, uh, more proto-capitalist than China, you don't have the organized pools of capital that will let you build a train that'll go 306 miles an hour. And your roads and your infrastructure and all those things are not good enough even for a very sophisticated microcredit network and widespread use of cell phones and cell phone businesses for poor people to overcome. So I, I ask you to think about that. What can the role of technology be in meeting the major challenges of the poor countries, which are to build minimally, minimally uh, invasive but comprehensive and effective institutions that reward positive behavior without stifling freedom? And what is the role of technologies in wealthy countries to promote institutional reform? And believe me, I'm not defending everything to government's done in the United States, I just think we got the wrong model here. If you set this up as the government's bad and the private sector is always good and any tax cut is good and any spending program that's not Medicare, Medicaid, or defense is bad, then you're gonna take America right out of the future business and drastically limit the role of creativity in creating a future-oriented society that put this country back in the reform business, back in reforming uh, education and health care and finance and government expenditures and the role of the proper role of regulation in the financial markets and all of those other questions that we just were turned inside out with over the last three years. So the role of technology has to be seen through the challenges in poor and rich countries and through how all are dealing with the three great 
specters hanging over the 21st century world, which is otherwise bound to be the most exciting time in human history. If we can deal with the massive inequality, which you see within and among countries, and it's very interesting, by the way, to note that some of the fastest growing economies of the last 20 years have been those rich countries that have minimized inequality, even at, alas, the cost of high taxes. I, I saw, uh, the, I watched the CPAC convention on television. That's what happens when you're home alone a lot, you waste a lot of time. <laughs> so anyway, I, I watched the CPAC convention and I saw, and it didn't surprise me, Newt Gingrich was the guy that had the best litany of ideas. Some of the ideas weren't good, but the litany was compelling. And, at least, <laughs> and they, were, they were specific. But Gingrich has also got some good ideas. He's pointed out that he thinks there's $70 billion in overspending every year in the Medicare program from turning the system because we have a pay for procedure instead of a pay for health care system. And he's got some good ideas. But he went into this romance about Germany and how Germany took manufacturing seriously. And, and Germany had an unemployment rate two points below America's. And German factory workers made 50% more than we did. But they were so productive, and he never pointed out that it's because they have a very well-organized government policy and higher taxes than we do. They just do the right things together. One of the reasons they had 2% unemployment rate lower than ours when they hadn't recovered as much as we had from the trough is that in addition to an unemployment system, they have a keep employed system where employers pay into a fund, and then they, it goes out early in a financial downturn to subsidize low uh, smaller units so that they won't have to lay people off. They can pay them less than full salary and draw from this fund. That's a dreaded government device. I say that j just to point out, Germany had ref reformed their unemployment system to make it a still employed system in a way that the employers liked because over the long run it cost them less money. We couldn't do that now here because you couldn't justify a new fee on employers in this bad economy. But when it recovers, we need to think about putting that in. Interestingly enough, one of the horrible impacts of that awful stimulus bill was to give states money to experiment with just this system. And one of the people who made the best use of it was another speaker at the CPAC convention, Haley Barber in Mississippi. <laughs> so somehow reality tends to intrude when people are flat on their back and they don't want to go under. And we want to do things together. But anyway, you get the point. We, we've got to, we, America needs to be in a continuous reform mode. We need to reform a lot of what government does at the national, state, and local level. That's why Andrew Cuomo's at 77% in the morning poll. People think that he's out here trying to fix New York and we pay too much for too little at state and local level and we have robbed our state of a lot of its future potential. So it doesn't mean he's right about all the specifics or wrong, I haven't studied it all, but I like that he's trying to deal with this stuff. But the, the real model in the wealthy countries should not be government versus the private sector. It should be today versus tomorrow. And whether we can create a tomorrow that everybody is a part of, and in order to do that, what is the best thing for the government to do and not do, and the same for the private sector, and what is the role of technology there, and how can we empower citizens to get that kind of reform, to reform our systems. In autocracies, it's obvious that the first thing you got to do is to in the control, but then the hard work begins. That's what all the people who were concerned about Egypt's historic role in being a force of stability against terror and being for preserving the peace with Israel and trying to get the peace with the Palestinians were talking about. Nobody was really trying to flack for oppression. Everybody recognizes that every government's first responsibility is to its own people. But there is a great deal of difference in tearing down a house and building a new one. What is the role of technology in building the new house? And how can we do it there? How can we do it in Haiti? How can we do it 
in the United States and every place else that needs to reform? And how can we have a political debate that is more balanced through technology than we do through the traditional media? Because nobody's wrong all the time either, folks. And I, you know, I read everything I can that the Tea Party crowd and the Republicans put out, you know, and I, and like I said, Newt Gingrich is right about that. There is a lot of churning in the Medicare system. Now, it's interesting, they didn't want to fool with that in the budget. They, they want to use the budget crisis as an excuse to get rid of AmeriCorps and foreign aid and things that really do empower people and help people because that makes government popular and that violates their ideology. But I think it's really important that we recognize what kind of world we're trying to build here. I also would say one other thing. I cannot emphasize enough the importance that I think the te technology played in preserving transparency and accountability in the reconstruction process in Indonesia after the tsunami and that it will play in Haiti if we can keep it going. And I think, you know, we began to put more and more government records on the internet when I was president, but I think it's also important in wealthy countries too. I think it's important uh, where there's a lot of discontent in states like New York and New Jersey. People don't know what's going on that's good or bad. And so we tend to lurch from one extreme to the other. And we don't want to fix New York at the expense of hurting good teachers or hurting good schools or hurting other things. We have to figure out how technology can be used to empower people as citizens in the wealthy as well as the poor countries and the ones that are rising dealing with both sets of challenges. And uh, I really do believe that at least in the political sphere, I don't mean choosing a political issue or party, but in the political sphere, so far, it has the greatest potential, especially since the United States Supreme Court now says the Congress has no power to equalize the voices of the rich and the middle class and the poor. That being rich gives you a God-given right to drown out everybody else's voice. And uh, I strongly disagree with that Citizens United decision, but it's the law of the land now, and uh, the country's survived worse. And the only thing that really gives us a realistic chance of offsetting that is technology. So, and let me just say one other thing that I'd like to ask for your help on. Uh, every year, at the opening of the United Nations, I have this gathering we call the Clinton Global Initiative. And we bring in philanthropists and NGOs from poor countries. We fly to bring them over here and, and business people. And we try to figure out how to solve the problems of the modern world. Not only inequality problems, but the instability problems as witnessed by the financial crisis and our vulnerability to terror. And the third problem obviously is climate change. It's an inherently unstable world in the way we produce and consume energy. There was a wonderful article yesterday on the business page of the New York Times about a federal government building that belongs to the Energy Department that's completely carbon neutral. And how they built it, what technology they used, and you could imagine what your payout would be if you were a non-governmental entity trying to build such a building with the tax credits and other things. But we bring people together around specific manifestations of the inequality, instability, and unsustainability issues. And we talk about them. What's the role of women and girls in their level of empowerment or disempowerment? Uh, and what, but the difference in our meeting and others is we try to answer a question we didn't debate enough in politics. Most of the time I was in politics, if you read the newspaper today, that's what most people talk about. They talk about what are you going to do and how much money are you going to spend on it? Or in this case, if you've got a big deficit, how much money are you going to save on it? I'm really encouraged by this debate now because even uh, from right to left, there is a serious discussion about 
like in New York, what we're dealing with now is if you have to cut the school budget, is it really a good thing to have a last in, first out policy for teachers in the wake of the latest uh, school, uh, education survey, which shows, unbelievably enough, and I'm a huge proponent of charter schools. There was one in America when I got funding for the first 2,000, and only two states, Minnesota and Arkansas, that had authorized them. So I believe in this. But they're charters. They have to be held accountable. And if they aren't, if you don't get rid of the ones that work, that don't work, then the system won't work. But anyway, this latest survey says, still the best thing of all, the most important thing is not whether it's a charter school, a public school, or a private school, not whether the classes are big or small, but whether the teacher's good. Big surprise. And if I polled all of you, you could probably, every one of you, even those of you who, like me, are entering their dotage, <laughs> probably can call the names of your best teachers still from the time you were in kindergarten. So the point is, this debate is new in America. Most of the time in politics, all we talk about is what are you going to do and how much money are you going to spend on it or not. We don't spend enough time thinking about how are you going to do it. That's why the Ford Foundation is important. That's why Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is important. That's why the Gates Foundation is profoundly important. That's what I try to do. I spend all my life trying to answer the how question. And I've been more political today in this talk because I'm worried about the discourse taking out half the relevant questions not who wins the next election. It's how the, it's the discourse. You can't, you have to ask the right questions to have any hope of getting the right answers. And I, I think this public-private divide is not the right divide. It's today versus tomorrow. There is no example of a successful country on planet Earth that doesn't have both a vigorous private sector and an effective government, and increasingly, a strong civil society. Technology is, ready-made to help all three of those entities deal with these inequality, unsustainability, and uns instability issues, but we have to ask the right questions. So when we do this meeting, we ask everybody to make a commitment, and we've raised $63 billion worth of commitments over in six years that will play out over a 10-year period, but we can already document 300 million people in 170 countries whose lives have been changed. Did we do everything right? No. But technology played an enormous role in it. And it empowered people to do things. And it, the other thing it does is it gives you a chance to overcome this number one criticism people make of NGOs, which is that there's too much overlap. Everybody wants to do the thing, same thing. You don't cooperate. It. If you have good technology, you can do that. One of the things we the reasons we ask in Indonesia and now in Haiti, we ask all the big NGOs to register their projects with us and have this commission approve it, which is half Haitian, half donors, and the NGOs are represented on it, is that it minimizes overlap. And then the, then the NGO efforts tend to reinforce each other and at least create the possibility that those things which have to be built into the fabric of Haitian life can be systematized. We are trying to answer the how question. So that's the last point I want to leave you with, that the, the, if you think about it, every single discussion you have had today and will have when I leave has that built into it. This is the only kind of discussion we can have dealing with all these issues where it's always about how. And it works if it answers the how question. And if it doesn't, you don't do it there. This is something that every Republican, every Democrat, every liberal, every conservative has to begin to think about. And particularly if we're going to reform the nature of government and deal with the places where we pay too much and get too little and not cut our nose off to spite our face by damaging our future in research and development and technology and clean energy and all these other things that are now at risk in the current framework, we have got to be able to say to the skeptics, here is the answer to the how question. So I, I leave you with that.
don't overestimate the miracles that any technology can perform in the absence of effective institutions, a fertile ground that will lift everybody up and deal with the inequality, instability, and unsustainability problems. But don't <coughs> underestimate the fact that every time you do something that works, you're answering the how question, the most neglected question in public life everywhere on planet Earth, at least in my lifetime. Uh, on balance, I'm still really optimistic. I mean, after all, look what's happened in the last year. It's a fun time to be alive. The, we learned in the last year that all of us whose genetic makeup is not 100% Sub-Saharan African, all the rest of us have between 1% and 4% of our genome from our pre-human ancestors, the Neanderthals, who occupied planet Earth for 40 or 50,000 years, coincident with humans and intermixed with them. It's a good thing they couldn't put their pictures up on the internet. We'd have been, and, and I always tell everybody that the two women in my family were not surprised to learn that I was part Neanderthal. <laughs> they were, however, stunned to learn that they were too. Then these astrophysicists thought they identified at least one planet in the constellation Libra outside our own solar system that seemed to have the conditions adequate to uh, support life, or was most like ours. Then it was called into question. Then it turns out there's a guy making a list of the whole, uh, everything he can find in any galaxy outside ours, and he thinks there might be a hundred of them or so. Then, in the Fermi lab, which has our best superconducting super collider here, because we gave up the Hadron one that's opening in Switzerland this year. It was in Texas till 1993. And it was my, when I was trying to get America back on a path to a balanced budget, the price that conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats joined together and extracted from me was that I'd give up my fascination with science and shut that sucker down and let the Europeans have it. And I warned him, I said, this is a terrible mistake. This is a really important thing. But anyway, we lost it. The important thing is that it got built and it's a global international cooperative endeavor anyway, so we contribute and participate. But the, the Hadron Collider in Switzerland will have to verify this, but the Fermi was called muons and everyone had always assumed that the positive and negative ones were in equal balance or matter wouldn't cohere and we would just fly off into space in a zillion parts, all of us. And it turns out, lo and behold, that at this small level of matter, it appears, after all, that the positive elements ever so slightly outweigh the negative ones. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Which means you cannot afford to be pessimistic. You cannot afford to look down your nose at somebody who disagrees with you. And for me, who was raised in the Southern Baptist Church, you can never give up on trying to convert anybody, even deathbed conversions are possible. <laughs> All of which is a, not only a psychological and theological, but most importantly, a biological validation of the commonality we all share and the fact that we need to go into the future together. That is the central mission of technology for social change giving us a future we share instead of one we kill each other over. Thank you.